Hi, everybody. We're back for a new stage of life, biosocial development in middle childhood. So this stage of life is going to take us from six years old until the onset of puberty. Okay. So what's going on with the middle child's body? Well, they are growing pretty steadily, um, about two or three inches a year and about four to six pounds a year across these six or seven years of middle childhood. Um, we're going to continue to see that cephalocaudal development and that proximodistal development. Um, so while the child is on average getting larger each year, they're going to be putting um, you know, a lot of growth into the head and then into the torso and less into the extremities, um, just like we've been seeing ever since, well, pretty much conception. Okay. Now, one of the biggest concerns um, during this period is nutrition and what's going on right now um, worldwide really is uh, obesity. Obesity is on the rise. Um, overweight children are far more likely to become overweight adults than our children who maintain normal weight through adolescence especially. So if we are in middle childhood between six and puberty and already carrying extra weight, um, it makes it more likely that that person will be overweight their entire lives and have the issues that can go along with that. Um, you know, it's a delicate balance between maintaining a healthy weight and making a child feel bad about their body type. Um, you know, genes in part determine uh, how our fat is accumulated and distributed on our bodies. And so there are a lot of variations on what um, children's bodies might look like as a function of how their you know, genes are made up. And so, for example, some children will, um, during middle childhood, start to accumulate some fat on their abdomen, but yet their arms and legs are still really thin. And that might just be their, their body type. It might not really be about um, being obese. It might just be that's how their body's designed. Um, but heredity won't explain the increase in obesity that we've been seeing because um, genes don't change that fast. Uh, so while heredity might explain different body types and heredity might explain um, you know, a tendency to hold weight, that would, would have been the case across all time. We wouldn't be seeing an increase suddenly in obesity. Um, so probably more important issues are things like you know, what parents do. Like um, parents um, who don't breastfeed their moms, who don't breastfeed their children, um, breast milk seems to have a protective effect on body mass index. Um, this video that I've linked in the classroom that's about the benefits of breastfeeding for staving off obesity, um, you can watch that. It talks about how um, there's something about the act of breastfeeding. It could be something in the milk, but it also could be the, uh, the way that um, babies are fed using breastfeeding. Because, um, because moms don't know how much milk their baby is actually consuming when they nurse, um, they can't look at it and say, okay, I prepared eight ounces of formula and I expect my baby to eat eight ounces of formula. Um, a breastfeeding mom feeds the baby till the baby's done feeding. And so uh, the baby learns to have control over feelings of fullness and things like that. So breastfeeding might do something chemically to kind of protect children from obesity later on, but it also might be sort of like setting up eating habits that make it less likely that children will overeat when they get older. Um, TV, of course, we, we blame TV a lot of the times for sedentary lifestyles. I think TV needs to be uh, read as screen time because these days children are not just looking at TVs and being sedentary. They're looking at iPads, they're looking at computer screens, they're looking at phones. Um, rather than running around, parents entertain their children with um, things that allow them to stay safe inside the house or, you know, to avoid bad weather or too hot of heat or things like that. And so um, kids are not necessarily getting the exercise that they used to get. Uh, we have a lot more soda consumption than we ever had before. And also uh, the, the contents of soda have changed over time. Um, so over the past 30 years, the switch was made from just regular cane sugar to uh, a high fructose corn syrup. Some people argue that that is um, more fattening than regular sugar, but the caloric match is actually identical. So I'm not exactly sure whether that's a valid complaint. Um, 
even diet soda has been associated with obesity. And, you know, some people say, well, yeah, people who are overweight start drinking diet soda. But the data is starting to point to there might be a, a different flow in the correlation where it might be that, in fact, the, the chemicals that are in diet soda actually um, foster obesity, actually contribute to, to obesity. So, you know, too much screen time, too many sugary um, drinks that are really empty calories, um, not getting enough exercise, not eating at the family dinner table and, you know, having conversations and chewing our food and knowing, uh, you, know, you know, that we're full and being able to stop eating when we're full. Um, it takes about 20 minutes for your blood sugar level to send the message back to the hypothalamus that you've actually eaten enough and you can stop eating now. But a lot of families are eating on the go, eating snacks in the car, um, things like that, that we really don't give our blood sugar time to funnel back to our hypothalamus and tell us to stop eating. We've already finished eating what we were going to eat. And so um, it could be all of these things combined or any part of these things that might contribute to the rise in obesity. Um, there are also social influences. You know, a lot of people have been looking at school lunches and, you know, probably 10 years ago, people um, start talking about trying to make school lunches healthier, lower calorie, less um, um, sugar and fats and things like that. I thought you guys might enjoy this video that I linked in our classroom that's about the contents of school lunches. I'm, I don't know why I can't get a preview when I when I go through some of these. Um, but this uh, NPR piece examines what's in um, hamburger and things that are served at school and, and it has a surprising twist so you should you should read it it's, uh, you should watch it it's a brief one it's like three minutes and um, it's got an interesting twist at the end so just uh, I don't want to spoiler alert you and ruin it so um, snack machines you know at schools the um, the school district started figuring out probably in the late uh, well, the mid to late 80s, that if they put vending machines in, in, on campus, uh, kids will buy snacks and the school will get extra revenue from it. And so they put snack machines on school campuses. Um, starting with the high school kids and then working their way down to middle schools now have them. And what, at least some do, not, it might not have been at your school, but um, some schools have them. And what they've realized is that having quick access to inexpensive foods that are not good for us make it more likely that we will eat inexpensive foods that are not good for us, right? So uh, there's been a push to put healthier things into snack machines, more water, more um, fruit. You can put fruit into a vending machine. You can put, um, you know, uh, beef jerky and other kinds of things that are, are um, nutritive, low fat, things like that, that can be healthy. Um, Food advertising. Kids are targeted all the time with the kinds of, uh, I always like to call them the naughty foods. The ones that we like, they taste good, but they are not what we should be filling our uh, our daily intake with. You know, things that are too sugary or too fatty or things like that. But they target kids. And then kids have unending amounts of energy to, you know, just harass their parents into buying them for them. Um, so, I mean, all of these kinds of social influence, like what their peers are eating is going to be another influence on their behavior. Uh, if a peer tries uh, or eats and enjoys a, a food item that a child has been a little skeptical of, for example, you know, you have a seven or eight-year-old who refuses to eat broccoli at home, but then they're sitting at school and they see that their friend is very happily eating broccoli out of their lunch pail, um, it makes it more likely that that, that child will try broccoli. Um, and then, of course, the inversion. If, there's, if the child has brought their broccoli to lunch and they're eating it dutifully because this is what's in their lunch, um, and then their friend is eating a ding-dong and some, and some chips, they might say, can, hey, can, can I have some? Or, mom, get me some of those things that I see my friend eating. Um, peers can have a big influence on what we want to eat, what we know is available to eat, and especially for children, um, it, it, they really want to fit in with what everybody else is consuming and things like that. You don't want to be the kid with the weird food. Um, you don't want to be the kid who never gets to have anything fun. Um, and you guys all remember trading at lunchtime and things like that. So uh, packing healthy lunches for kids or having healthy lunches available at the school or whatever, is, and then good snacks and things like that could really help with the obesity problem that we have. Um, the good news I have to tell you is that obesity seems to have plateaued in this age group for the past probably four years. So that's good news. Um, and... Staying on the good news theme, this is a very healthy time of life. 
So we're looking on the top chart, you know, um, we've got the six to about 12 or 13 um, would be the beginning of, of well, for most kids, um, adolescents. So you'll notice that these are very low rates of, of deaths per 1,000 individuals, right? Um, it's like the lowest time in all of childhood. And then if we go to the bottom chart, we see this is spanning us out for our whole lifespan. And you see that very, well, I mean, really, it's a very healthy time all the way up until about age 25, where very few people are dying during these younger age groups. So it's a very healthy time. We're going to start to really enjoy really good, stable health and um, vitality during this period of time. Now, brain-wise, I'm showing you the same picture that I've been showing you across the past two um, you know, stages of life, because we're at that point where really the, you know, the sensory cortex, you know, seeing and the hearing, um, and, then the, and then the language cortex, these things have reached their full maturity by this point. And so the kids um, are functioning at the highest level with those things. Uh, what's continuing to develop is the higher cognitive functions. And that's actually going to follow us through most of adolescence, because the especially prefrontal cortex really has to um, reach its full maturation in late adolescence, early adulthood. Um, so we see pruning of irrelevant connections. We see the addition of myelination, like we talked about in the last age group. So what we're seeing is continued improvement in cognition and motor skills and things like that. So reaction time improves. Um, thinking speed improves. Kids can answer questions more quickly. Um, they have faster access to memories. Um, now, as we move through this point in our child development, um, with every passing year during middle childhood, a, a child becomes less and less likely to become a balanced bilingual. Um, that's kind of an older term, the term that, that we used when I was studying psycholinguistics as a, as a PhD candidate. Um, it's kind of fallen out of favor because it implies that the alternative is to be an unbalanced bilingual, and that doesn't sound right. But what I think the word is completely descriptive of what it is, which is a person who can speak two languages equally fluently, that they understand the language, they can produce the language with um, you know, minimal accent, um, understanding and speaking fluently. They've got both languages housed in their language centers. I mean, it's just a completely balanced bilingual. Um, by the way, you could be a balanced trilingual, um, quadrilingual. It becomes harder and harder to be those things because it's hard to be exposed to enough um, consistency of these variety of languages. Um, it really takes one parent devoting themselves to speaking to their child in a single language and the other parent or other caregiver or other you know person who has very consistent contact with the child to just always speak in the other language and insist here's the critical part if you're ever thinking about you're trying to develop a balanced bilingual maybe you and and whoever you know you're raising the child with um, speak two different languages you have to agree you you will speak in one language and your partner speaks in the other language and they have to be con you have to be completely consistent you only speak in that language when addressing the child and you demand that they respond to you in that language otherwise you can end up with what's called a receptive bilingual where they understand what you're saying to them but they can't produce the language back so it's a really kind of a trick to make sure that you're producing a balanced bilingual and not somebody who's actually just receptive Although receptive is a huge leap ahead of what, you know, most monolinguals have. So if, if all you get is a, a receptive bilingual, that's, I'd be happy with it. But you know, most people are trying to get a, a person who can understand and speak. So um, you have to make sure that they answer you in the same language. All right. Now on this slide, I have a couple of different videos. One's um, showing like sort of typical boy gross motor skills at this age bracket. And then I've got one that's showing sort of a classic girl um, gross motor skills. So you'll find those linked in the Canvas classroom. Um, what's going on right now is just really dramatic improvement in motor skills during this period of life. And, and mostly we're going to see these improvements coming from, you know, the myelination that's occurring in the brain, the development of the synapses in the motor cortex so that the child just, you know, has finer control over their gross motor skills. But probably the biggest contributing factor is that children are willing to practice uh, those skills probably more than they would be at other times in their lives. And then also they've had more experience. You know, with age, the more 
the older you're, you're getting, the more experience you, you probably have with the behavior. So they can run and they can jump and they can um, swing a bat and they can throw a ball and they can you know, catch things and they can somersault and all these things that they're doing that you know, with more and more experience and more and more practice, they become better and better and better. Of course, a lot of times practice and experience come in the contact, context of uh, their peers and that uh, peer encouragement, sort of not, not necessarily peers going, yay, you can do it, but more like their peer being able to do it themselves might, some, for some kids, drive them to want to be able to do it as well too, right? That little bit of competition that makes kids go, hey, I can do it. Um, those things all feed together to really contribute to improving gross motor skills. Now, the fine motor skills are also improving. You know, in the last age of, uh, stage of life, I had mentioned, you know, that fine motor skills were not super good in the, in the younger child. By now, they're starting to get better. And so um, they can play with things like Legos and, you know, really manipulate those smaller blocks and get them onto those smaller little pins and all those things. But, I mean, the handwriting may not be perfect. Um, I found this on the Internet, and it's kind of cute because um, if it was really poorly spelled, the parent decided to try and, you know, give us a hint. But on Friday, I went to the, I think that's musical. Uh, my weekend, I went to soccer. And not only, of course, the spelling isn't very good, but some of the writing is a little questionable, right? It shows that they don't have great control over their pencil, but, you know, some of them, some of the letters are capital, some are lowercase. I mean, Pretty typical for especially you know the seven, eight, nine year olds in the in this age group to not have great uh, fine motor control to produce really good handwriting. By adolescence, we'll start to really see the fine motor skills just dramatically improve. But right now, you know the kids are working on it. And one of the things that's nice about kids this age is that they're diligent and they're willing to work on things that maybe when they get a little older they might not be as willing to work on. Now, what about children with special needs? Um, I've got a link here to the Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder um, DSM-5 description, and I think it's really super important for us to take a second and look at the symptoms of ADHD and then how they're diagnosed, because I think a lot of times people think that these... Uh, that this is a disorder that is really easily labeled on kids. And um, it's not, you have to have six or more of the symptoms of inattention if you're up to age 16. If you are um, 17 or older, you only need to have five of the symptoms. And that really underscores the issue of, you know, kids are kind of inattentive. And so you, that's why you have to have so many of these symptoms if you're between six and puberty to be diagnosed with with inattention. Um, so having difficulty, you see this, um, all of them start with often. Um, this has to be more common than not, that this is how the child behaves. Um, you know, everybody has times when we fail to give close attention to details. We all have trouble holding attention on, on certain tasks. Um, you know, we all have times when we have these issues. The key phrase in each of those sentences is often. Um, and then, you know, is easily distracted, is forgetful. And then we have hyperactivity and impulsivity. And again, you're gonna to have to have at least six of these symptoms if you're in the age group we're talking about. You only need five if you're 17 or older. And oh, I forgot to mention that, um, present for at least six months. Um, kids can go through phases where things are, are going on in their lives. It could be brain development. It could be, um, you know, their dog died or, or mom and dad are getting divorced or there was the birth of a new baby, or you know, there's a number of different kinds of things that can cause children to temporarily, you know, they moved, um, something like that that could cause a child to temporarily display some of these behaviors. Um, you need it to be often and consistent, more than six months. And so you see the, de the definitions, the, the symptoms of hyperactivity. Uh, so, so you got to have at least six of those if you're in the age group we're talking about. And then um, in addition, you have to have these conditions, several inattentive or hyperactive impulsive symptoms before the age of 12 years. Well, this would be our age group. Um, several symptoms are present in two or more settings. So you wouldn't want to diagnose a child just because they're having difficulty at school with paying attention and, um, you know, um, waiting his turn and things like that. You want to make sure that this is, um, this is 
consistent. It's across uh, pretty much all the settings that the child finds themselves in, um, two or more at least. And then there's, a cl there's clear evidence that the, that the symptoms interfere with or re reduce the quality of social uh, functioning. You know, they're having difficulty making friends and keeping friends. They're having difficulty functioning at schools so that they can't get their homework done, their grades are suffering, um, or work functioning if they're all over um, the age of 17. And then, of course, we always have to have the differential diagnosis, that it's not something else that would be a better explanation for the symptoms. So um, this little fact sheet from the um, Centers for Disease Control can be really helpful if you're thinking at all thoughts about a person you know or something like that yourself maybe and you can go through here and um, look at the symptoms and realize that there I mean there's a large number of symptoms required and consistency and persistence that is needed for the person to be diagnosed. Um, the same thing I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, disability uh, learning disabilities. Uh, a lot of times people misunderstand what a learning disability is and so um, I found this nice um, learning disability online, which is a little you know, sort of warehouse of information that people who are concerned about their child who might have a learning disability um, can go to find information, get more details. Um, and really what I wanted to focus on, and I wanted you guys to see the link and so that you would be able to um, find it on your own. And the thing is, um, learning disabilities are, um, Children with learning disabilities are as smart or smarter than their peers. The definition of a learning disability is that the, that the child scores in the average or above average um, area of intelligence, but they have difficulty with specific um, school-based skills like reading, writing, spelling, reasoning, recalling, or organizing information. Um, so they're behind their peers on like something very fundamental. Usually what uh, schools will focus on is that they're at least two years behind in reading or math, and, but otherwise have um, you know, normal or above average intelligence. So I really wanted to, to make sure that we highlighted that part and then let you see that there's this warehouse. If you're interested in learning disabilities, um, you know, here, there's this warehouse of information with lots of links and, and um, topics and um, I, resources for teachers who are working with kids who have learning disabilities and what parents can do to you know, help their kids to function well and things like that. So I just thought this was a really good resource to point out to you guys. Um, but the key thing I want to just take away on that one, so ADHD, got to have a lot of symptoms in order to be diagnosed. Uh, learning disability, a, average or above average intelligence, but you're behind in one or more major areas of school. All right. Dyslexia. Uh, dyslexia is a reading issue. Um, dyslexia means um, bad lexical awareness. Dys means bad and lexical means, lex lexia means um, lexical or written. So a person with dyslexia oftentimes has difficulty distinguishing, for example, lowercase b's from lowercase d's. Um, or they, a lot of times, will make guesses when reading words. They, like in the middle, it feels like the middle of the word is sort of scrambled to them. So they sort of make guesses based on what the first and the last parts of the words are. Um, so they may be supposed to read the word bladder, and they read it, they make guesses, blubber, um, things like that, trying to, trying to guess what it must be. And a lot of times the guesses are not based on context, so they won't realize what they read up to this word that they're having trouble recognizing um, gives you a hint what that word might be and it helps to foster a good guess um, because they're just focusing on the fact that they can't kind of sort out what's in the middle of that word. Um, dyslexia is not very well understood as far as like exactly what causes it. Um, it one, one hypothesis is that it's not actually a visual problem, it's an auditory problem that the very letters that get confused the most often in dyslexia are the ones that sound the most similar. B's and D's, for example, P's. They are also drawn the most similarly, right? Like lowercase B's and D's are just the same thing inverted, right? Um, you know, flipped back and forth. And so uh, one hypothesis is that a person with dyslexia it has difficulty keeping up with the auditory co codes that their brain is generating while they're reading. Um, so they're working on ways to maybe intervene. 
It's difficult though. It's uh, a lot of times people with dyslexia have to just learn ways to work around and one strategy doesn't necessarily work for another person with dyslexia. Um, there are a lot of really famous people who, uh, whose jobs rely on being able to read things. Like for example, Tom Cruise is dyslexic and uh, he has to read scripts. And so you know, workarounds are possible. Um, I'm always just shocked and disappointed when I have students in college who were identified as dyslexic when they were in school and were never provided with any kinds of ideas or lessons or strategies for working around it. Um, it seems like that's one of the fundamental jobs of education is to figure out when a person has something like dyslexia and then give them strat strategies to work around it. Uh, but it looks like it's kind of a difficult thing to pin down and, and um, so one, one solution doesn't work for everybody and therefore it makes it difficult to come up with ideas that would work for most people. My last uh, thing on the list is autism spectrum disorder. You know, a lot of times kids who get diagnosed on the spectrum get diagnosed in early childhood, but it starts to have bigger implications when they enter school and have peers and things like that. And where you are on the spectrum will determine how you are placed in school. So for example, some, some children are very high functioning on the, on, the, on the spectrum, and so they have um, you know, really good intelligence and have no difficulty with remembering things, but they maybe just have difficulty with eye contact or empathizing with the mental state of their friends or whatever. And so they may have mostly just social issues that they're dealing with. Other people who are farther along on the, on the more, um, on the deeper end of the spectrum may have um, you know, repetitive behaviors that they engage in, or when they get upset, they might do self-harming behaviors and things like that that are really distressing and, and um, difficult for teachers to deal with. So they may have to be placed in other classrooms with specially trained teachers to work with that. Um, so they, they got rid of, with the DSM-5, uh, they got rid of the terminology that some of you might be familiar with, which is, for example, the term Asperger syndrome. Um, that was the name that they used to use for really high-functioning people on the autism spectrum. Now they call it high-functioning, uh, it's a really complex term, it's like high-functioning autism spectrum or, or something like that. Um, they got rid of some of the terms that you might have been more familiar with. Uh, they also are discouraging people from using the word autistic and instead are um, asking people to use the terms uh, people with autism or person with autism. So. Some, some um, language changes came with DSM-5. Some diagnostic changes came. One of the things about the DSM-5 is that by changing the diagnosis and changing the criteria for the diagnosis, it included a lot more people into the diagnosis. So for example, um, being single-minded about a topic and um, not necessarily being sensitive to whether your audience is interested in what you're talking about or not, those kinds of things. Um, have now become part of the diagnosis that hadn't necessarily been part of it before. And so when you see that autism is on the rise, part of the rise in autism is attributable to changes in uh, you know, the rate of it actually in the base rate in the population. But part of it, a large part of it, is attributable to um, changes in the diagnosis and um, that has broadened the definition and has made more people uh, qual you know, qualify for the diagnosis. So, um, things to keep in mind. I mean, sometimes when when we say when we say that a disorder is increasing, sometimes it's because it's increasing, and sometimes it's because diagnosis of it is increasing, and those are not necessarily the same thing. So things to keep in mind. All right, that is biosocial development. The next time I see you, we will be talking about cognitive development in middle childhood.